Well, thank you, Erica, for that warm <laughs> introduction. It is much easier to dance in front of people than to speak. <laughs> but I'm going to do my best today. So when I was asked to teach on this topic, to be honest, my first reaction was, me? <laughs> I'm certainly no expert. And in fact, I can think of many other women more qualified than me to teach on this topic. But as I thought about it, God truly has transformed me in this area. And boy, am I grateful for that. Thinking back to those first few years of marriage, I was a completely different woman. <laughs> Even though I was a Christian, the worldly depiction of what a woman should be was deeply embedded. I was very career-driven, not in any rush to have children, and was very thankful that my husband liked to cook and clean. <laughs> he did everything, and I was happy to let him. <laughs> Even though I knew what the Bible said about my role in the home, I really had no intention of moving in that direction. It wasn't until my husband and I joined a small group book study where the men were going through the book called Exemplary Husband, and the women were reading The Excellent Wife by Martha Peace. That is when I started to feel convicted. In fact, admittedly, I wanted to throw the book across the room a few times. I thought, who is this lady? She is definitely stuck in the past. <laughs> All I could picture was this. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure what she's cooking up in that picture, but he's actually really happy about it. <laughs> and I'm not sure why she's so happy to be cleaning whatever she's cleaning in the sink. <laughs> that was certainly not me. I pictured myself more like this. <laughs> Superhero cape and all, you guys. My poor husband, he was so very patient with me. So that book study was the catalyst in God convicting me to embrace and to love my God-given role as the caretaker of my home. So all of us here this morning are blessed to be mothers, and many of us are married, which means we also have a husband to care for. Now, we are called to love and to care for these gifts in an understanding and sacrificial way. So let's put our first point down like this. Point number one, take seriously the high calling of stewardship. So what exactly does the Bible say about how we should love and care for our homes and those precious souls who live there. The Bible teaches us a lot about love. First and foremost, we love because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 7 through 11 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. One of the evidences we see of his love for us is his good design for women to be the caretakers of the home. So last week, we looked at Proverbs 31, which is such a beautiful depiction of a godly wife and mother. Let's look specifically today at Proverbs 31, 27. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. We also see in the New Testament, Paul exhorting the older women to train up the younger women as we pick up in verse 3 of Titus 2, 3 through 5. The older women are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Wow, despite what the culture says, the role of a woman as a wife, mother, and caretaker of the home is a very high calling, 
and one we cannot take lightly. So now, how do we get busy stewarding our homes well? Let's write down point number two. Stewardship comes with a cost. <clears throat> we saw in 1 John 4 that God is love. We certainly do not deserve his love. In Romans 5, 8, it says, But God shows his love for us, for in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love is unmerited, it's gracious, and constantly seeking the benefit of the ones he loves. So if that is our example, then we must pour ourselves out for the benefit of our family. Our senior pastor, Pastor Elliot, defines love as this. Love is the greatest good for another at any cost. Now before we can effectively do this, we must first consider our husband's opinion and preferences when it comes to our homes. <laughs> I know it's humbling, but you actually have to ask him. <clears throat> like I mentioned before, my husband loves to cook. He grew up in a big family, and everyone had to help with the cooking. He also spent many years working at Disneyland in the kitchens, so when I say he knows how to cook, I mean he can cook. <laughs> And I was happily enjoying his gourmet meals every night until the day I quit working and became a stay-at-home mom. He then very kindly told me that dinner was now my responsibility. <laughs> Boo! <laughs> I was not a good cook, and I was quite honestly intimidated by the kitchen. <laughs> but I put on my big girl pants, and I started making all of our meals. Well, a few years later, we were on a tour of the USS Midway in San Diego. If you haven't been, I highly suggest. It's really cool. As we were walking through the kitchen area of the ship, there was this huge book with a list of all the menu items for each day. As we flipped through it, surprised by the variety of meals, the plaque under the book said that not a single meal was repeated for 30 days. <clears throat> My husband said jokingly, Wow, if they cannot repeat a meal for 30 days while feeding thousands of soldiers, we can certainly do that at home. We had a good laugh. However, I realized there was some truth to his joking. Here I was thinking I was doing this awesome job at cooking for our family, but little did I know he was not loving my lack of creativity and variety in our meals. I mean, there's only so many times you can eat spaghetti. <laughs> I didn't know because I didn't ask. So please, ladies, ask your husbands what are their preferences when it comes to caring for your home. So let's start with our first subpoint, letter A. It will be a sacrifice of time. There is never enough time in the day. We live in a fast-paced world where there is always something competing for our time and attention. Now, whether you are a stay-at-home mom or a working mom, I have been both, and I truly understand it's hard both ways. We must consider if we are making the best use of our time. So I broke this up into two categories. Number one, your personal time, and number two, your family calendar. So when it comes to your personal time, we must take an honest look at our daily routine. If you are a stay-at-home mom, are you using your time efficiently? If you work outside of the home, are you prioritizing time before or after work to care for the needs of your family? So here's what I do in order to help keep myself on task for the week. Step one is I like to meal plan. Now, if you missed Kristen's teaching on meal planning, please go back and watch it. It was very helpful and practical. So I like to create my meal plan on Sunday nights. And then I usually grocery shop Monday morning of each week. I hate grocery shopping, and I hate going multiple times through the week. So I make my list, and I knock it out on Monday so I'm prepared for the week. I also like to have a few staples on hand that I can quickly throw together a meal if our schedule gets thrown a curveball. I know that my husband prefers not to eat out, so I do my best to cook at home most nights of the week. Step number two, I make a list. 
Make a list of everything you need to do and want to get done. At the beginning of each week, I like to do a brain dump of everything. I love a good list and I use pen and paper. That way, it's so satisfying when you get to cross that off your list. I write down everything. The doctor appointment that needs to be made, the person I need to text, the laundry that needs to be folded, the email that needs to be responded to. I write down everything. For me, if I don't write it down, I will forget. So once you get your list down, you can go through and prioritize the things that need to be done right away or decide if some of it can be pushed out maybe even into the next week. I keep my list on a notepad so I can always easily transfer those remaining items to the next week. Step number three, do not be idle. Trust me, laziness is something I battle on a daily basis. I am not a hard worker by nature. It is something I have to force myself to do. Elizabeth George writes in her book, A Woman After God's Own Heart. She says, throughout the day, I tell myself, Elizabeth, there is profit in all labor. It's great to keep the work in nice, neat piles labeled A, B, and C tasks. But if you just keep moving, it will all get done. So I keep moving all day long. I have lists and a general schedule, which can even include a break or a nap. But other than my quiet time, I'm busy doing something all day long. Now this really resonates with me. I think of this and push myself to keep moving and to keep checking off those list items. Too many times I sit down for a minute to check a text or an email, and I end up on Instagram for 40 minutes. I mean, I can't be the only one. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that our phones are one of the biggest distractions and will rob us of our productivity, efficiency, and will tempt us to eat the bread of idleness. Now, Erica did a great teaching about a month ago on time management. So if you missed it, that is definitely worth going back to as well. Now, my second category of time is managing the family calendar. We are usually the ones who plan and schedule everything. I urge you to take an honest look at what your week looks like. If you spend half of your day in the car, driving kids to school, then to soccer, then to piano, then to karate, then to baseball, when will you have time to do the things at home that need your attention? Or when will you have time together as a family? Something we did for a long time that was really effective was to designate a family night. Friday night was that night for us. We protected that night each week to spend together. We would go out to dinner or have an at-home movie night, maybe a family game night, and sometimes it was as simple as just going out for ice cream after dinner. Now that my teenager has a job, it's really hard to protect Friday nights anymore. So I urge you to take advantage of the time now while you are in control of the calendar. Subpoint B, under Stewardship comes with a cost is it's a sacrifice of finances. Now, nobody likes to talk about money. It is often a point of contention and is never fun. So I will keep this brief, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention it because this is another area in which we can be good stewards of our homes. Whether you manage the finances or your husband does, make sure to have an open and honest conversation about it so you can be on the same page. Does he mind if you drive through Starbucks every day or would he prefer you to save money and have coffee at home? Does the budget allow for you to buy all of the spring decor at Hobby Lobby to update your living room? Or is it okay for you to spend $200 to get your hair done? <laughs> I may or may not be using real life examples. <laughs> In our home, my husband handles our finances. He is brilliant at creating Excel spreadsheets, so we have a very detailed one for our finances. <laughs> now, I'm the spender in the family, so I cringe when he says, come here and let's look at the budget. <laughs> oh, no thank you. <laughs> However, as the steward of my home and the person who does most of the shopping, it is important to take into account our budget 
to make sure that I don't overspend. What this looks like practically is that I run it by him first if I plan to make a lot of purchases. And I have to be ready to hear the word no. Your husband might not want to weigh in on all of your purchases. Maybe he would prefer that you just handle it. The point is that you should ask him. Now letter C is sacrificially create a refuge. We want our homes to be a place where our family wants to spend time. Something my husband has said to me many times is how much he looks forward to coming home to us at the end of a busy workday. I truly cherish that compliment because it wasn't always that way. I had to seriously consider what the temperature and vibe of my home would be when others walk through the front door. So here are three practical ways you can create a refuge. Number one, keep your home clean and tidy. Now I fully understand that when you have kids in the home, the house feels impossible to clean. I am not suggesting you make your kids feel like they are not allowed to actually live in your home. Just consider the overall feeling as you walk into your house. Clutter and mess does not allow for a very welcoming return for your husband. So try adding a 15 minute cleanup routine with your kids before he comes home. You can even make a fun game out of it like, let's see who can pick up the most Legos in one minute. I'm setting my timer and go. At least that works for boys because everything's a competition. I don't know about girls, I don't have girls. <laughs> you can also develop a consistent cleaning schedule so you don't have to deep clean in a panic the next time you have guests over. Number two, create beauty. Again, I'm not saying your home must look like Chip and Joanna Gaines just renovated, and you don't have to spend a lot of money. Find ways to make your home beautiful and welcoming to all who walk through the doors. You can light candles, diffuse essential oils, or have music playing. Maybe you pick up fresh flowers every week to spruce up your dining table. Perhaps you have a green thumb and you can adorn your home with beautiful plants. Now having a five-year-old has been really fun because he gets such a kick out of me changing out our seasonal decor. And it's not expensive. It's as simple as having just a few items for each holiday that I swap out on our fireplace mantle. He comes down and he walks in and he's like, ooh, it's a shamrock, <laughs> or oh, a heart for Valentine's Day. <laughs> it's really cute. And number three, check your attitude. <laughs> when your husband walks in the door after work, how do you greet him? Is it a loving, hi honey, how was your day? Or is it a, thank goodness you're home, I've had the worst day. <laughs> to be honest, this one is hard for me. Now that I homeschool, I am home a lot with my five-year-old. <laughs> and I am so ready for an adult conversation by the time my husband gets home that I just want to unload all of my unspent words for the day. <laughs> I have to hold it in so I can pleasantly greet him and let him settle. <laughs> Or maybe you're home with a baby all day and you just want to hand over your baby to your husband so you could take a shower. I get it. But after your spouse has been at work all day, you should happily welcome him home and let him settle in before you unload. <laughs> and how is our attitude with our kids? Do they receive the brunt of our frustration and overwhelm? Recently, my teenager shared something with me that was super convicting. <laughs> Just wait till you have teenagers, it's very humbling. <laughs> he told me that the tone of my words make him feel like he is super inconvenient to me when he comes home from school. <sighs> that could not be further from the truth. I am so excited to see him when he comes home after being gone at school all day and volleyball practice. The problem is, is he comes in at the worst time. <laughs> It's 5.30, I'm usually in the kitchen making dinner, and my five-year-old's buzzing around trying to get my attention. My poor teen just walks into the perfect storm and gets my very annoyed and frustrated tone. I had to humbly apologize to him for making him feel that way. 
Now, I share that example because if I'm trying so hard to build a refuge in my home, I shouldn't only be focusing on my attitude with my husband, but also with my children. Proverbs 31, 26 says, She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Boy, is this one a dagger to my soul. I so desperately desire to be a woman who speaks wisdom and kindness. Now, all of these are just a few ways that we can make intentional sacrifices in order to steward our homes well. And sacrifice doesn't come naturally. (laughs) We need to be constantly seeking the benefit of those in our home over our own desires. Your kids will not be in your home forever. So that brings me to point number three. Your stewardship is temporal. We have a limited amount of time with our kids in our homes. This is becoming all too real for me as my oldest son is turning 18 this summer. Our homes will look very different one day when all of our kids have been launched into the world. The goal is that whatever they learned from you in stewarding your home well and caring for them will be passed on to your grandchildren. Carolyn Mahaney writes in her book, Feminine Appeal, My mother's delight in her home made a distinct impression on me as a young girl. She was always cheerful and eager to serve her family. It was not uncommon for my mom to be smiling or laughing, and I still have vivid memories of her singing hymns or praise songs as she performed her daily tasks. I appreciated my mother's joy even more when I would spend the night with friends from school. Many of my friends' moms yelled at their children or were often unhappy and depressed. And I remember thinking, I'm sure glad my mom's a happy mom. But most importantly, we want to model sacrificial love to our family in order to point them to Christ. This is also a reminder that this world is temporary. We will all stand before God one day and give an account for how well we cared for the gifts we were given to steward. While the details in which we care for our homes will look different, we all should strive for sacrificially loving those within our home just as God loves us. So my hope is that today you walk away feeling encouraged in your high calling as a woman. Doing all of this well doesn't happen overnight. I am still learning how to better care for my home and my family. But 20 years ago, I hated to cook, clean, and the thought of being a stay-at-home mom was honestly revolting to me. It's amazing how God has transformed me, and I find joy now in making homemade fruit snacks and was excited, so excited that we curated the perfect made-from-scratch ranch dressing recipe that I made a reel about it on Instagram. (laughs) I mean, who am I, you guys? (laughs) Now, it takes extra time to make my own ranch, but because my boys practically drink it from the bottle, I wanted to make sure it was healthy. So in my book, that is a worthy sacrifice. Now, whatever that may look like for you, Find joy in the worthy sacrifices for your family. Every basket of laundry folded, toilet cleaned, or meal prepared, you are fulfilling your high calling as a woman. Don't let the culture tell you otherwise. By studying God's word and understanding my high calling as a woman, I now find joy and purpose in managing my home. The stewardship of your home will change over time as your kids get older, your finances change, or you move into a different house. Whatever season you are in, I exhort you to look well to the ways of your household and pour yourselves out in sacrificial love. So I'll end with this quote from Elizabeth Elliot. The way you keep your house, the way you organize your time, the care you take, in your personal appearance, the things you spend your money on all speak loudly about what you believe. The beauty of thy peace shines forth in an ordered life. A disordered life speaks loudly of disorder in the soul. 
So thank you all so much. Enjoy your time doing the table discussion questions.